So you're a game from the early 2000s. Si. And you think you were a good game? Si. So what's your gig? Is it to slow down time like that one detective? Is it to become a straight up thug in an open world? Or even better, is it to be able to rewind time and run across walls like that one guy with a bowl cut from Persia? Si. <laughs> I don't know if I've played anything like this game before. Simply put, you're the protagonist of just about any Indian movie you can think of. But it's Mexican. It's a very nonchalant, lighthearted, and casual game that involves corruption, obviously because it's a Mexican themed game, drugs, kingpins, the DEA, and undercover cops. Well, one or two. Trust me, I'm not joking when I say that this is exactly why I love the early 2000s. Nobody gave a crap about how stereotypical this game was. Now I know what you're probably thinking. Is this the rip-off of Max Payne? And to you, my friend, all I have to say is... No. No, it's not. Getting into the gameplay, you can already see that this was an open world game. Which was a pretty popular genre in the early 2000s because most games at that time did not even have this feature. So it was kind of a flex to include it. The open world had some small mini games, but nothing too special. You also get a wide variety of weapons to use, including M4s, Uzis, and the gun that is commonly popularized in every shooting game. That of course being the military grade rocket launcher. Yes, and this too. You can tell just by the look of the game that it was primarily designed for consoles because the gunfight in this game does not involve a crosshair. And I know that you're gonna call me a liar because of this little dot, but I'm not kidding. This red circular outline indicates that the bullets are gonna be within the reticle, meaning that all your shots are gonna be very inaccurate. You can prevent this by focusing on the target, which I found particularly useful because I kept missing all my shots and wasting all my bullets, leaving me to resort to other means of violence. Come here, mom! You also have some crazy abilities in the game, which you can earn by scoring enough points in each mission, including the A direct reference to this bit. And El Toro, where the character turns you into a bull. And this is my personal favorite ability in the entire game, spawning a fat man to beat the living shit out of your enemies. You can also rewind time like Prince of Persia, but unlike Prince of Persia, you actually get a bonus health for rewinding time. And the part of the game that you've all been waiting for? Moaning pedestrians. I'm kidding. It's actually bullet time. I was under the impression that Total Overdose was a direct bootleg of Max Payne. It was my brother that convinced me to try it out. And why did I miss out? The bullet time in this game is insane. I would genuinely argue that it's better than Max Payne's. Why? Because you can pull off crazy stunts like this. Spicy. I'm sure you noticed these titles for killing in bullet time, but would you be surprised to know that every little combination you can think of in your kills shows up here. Kill out of a moving car? Check. Getting a double kill off a wall? Check. Finding the person you argued with online and doxing? Okay, maybe not that one. But they reward you with extra points. These points grant you more abilities and exquisite weapons. In a nutshell, the crazier your kills are, the higher the multiplier. The higher the multiplier, the crazier you can be in each game. Believe me when I say this, I have never had to use the restart button because I never died. The game is so easy and casual and the only time I did die, the rewind just kind of brought me back. I often sit down to play a certain game to get some recording for my YouTube, but it's rare for me to forget about the recording and join the game itself, which happened this time. I just like how lighthearted and cuckoo this game is, and I guess you could call it... Loco. There is no realism in the game whatsoever, even canonically, because he does a bunch of crazy shit and gets away with it. Bye, have a great time! The game always remains casual, regardless how thick the plot gets. Speaking of plot... We start by playing the game as Ernesto Cruz, a DEA agent that's looking for papers on a highly notorious kingpin. During his search, he ends up in a very dangerous gunfight. He manages to escape on a plane, only to discover that his colleagues would end up being corrupt and he's thrown out of the plane to meet his demise. The game then cuts to another DEA agent, Tommy Cruz, his son. He had found a lead on his father's death and went to pursue it and got the military in Afghanistan treatment. Oh, crazy. <laughs> 
So he bails his twin brother, Ramiro Cruz, also called Ram, out of jail. Ramiro does not want to help his brother, but does so anyway because not everyone likes to drop the soap in the shower like Diddy. What? Since the two brothers are twins, Ramiro uses Tommy's identity to go undercover to follow up on the lead on their dad. As his first mission, he is told to meet Marco. Marco is a man that works for Caesar Morales, who is somewhat of a kingpin. Marco provides information to Tommy about cartels, acting as a snitch, or a rat as you would call it. Upon meeting Marco, Ramiro is given the job of protecting him from the cartel because he got a little too good at poker, which now that I think back at it is a pretty accurate representation of casinos now. Anyways, after saving Marco, he tells us that we need to act as a straight up thug to get a reputation going to be noticed by Caesar. Kind of reminds me of another game I really like. After acting like a gangster, we finally get noticed by Caesar, and he asks us to prove our worth to him by telling us to sabotage the opposing cartel's fertilizing factory, and bringing the drug lord's prized possession, his red card, to him. I honestly understand why he would want that card for himself, because it's almost like a beauty. <laughs> Oh. Afterwards, three of Caesar's trucks, which were planned to be used for smuggling coke, are stolen by the opposing cartel as payback. So he tells Ramiro to bring those trucks back and to detonate a van filled with dynamite in the cartel's ship to sink it as a message. After which Ramiro gets tired of working for his brother, but the Caesar's enforcer, Angel, overhears this. The plan was to ambush the coke with a large team led by agents Pearson and Johnson. Caesar asks Ramiro to protect the three trucks containing the goodies so they can be securely transported. But Ramiro is then told by his brother to follow the trucks to confirm the location of the ambush. And upon the DEA's arrival, Ramiro's cover is already blown. Because of Angel. Or so you would think. Angel is also undercover, she's a lieutenant, and saves Ramiro from the whole situation. She then gives Ramiro the job to make a friendly trade with Caesar's rivals, to give them information of him in exchange for other information. Gentlemen, I'm gonna make you an offer you can't refuse. This information involves the higher up Caesar seems to be working under, and we are told by this person that the papers backing this claim up is kept in a secure safe in his bullring. So we go there, pull up the <laughs> on his face and acquire the papers. The documents state a person named PM, which we later find out stands for Papa Muerte, who already knew about Ramiro, which he found out through one of his anonymous men that works inside the DEA. Knowing that Papa Muerte is somehow connected to his father's death, he goes to his lead, Elvis as Carla. This is where Ramiro notices that there is a lot of empty crates or coffins and weapons. To know more about it, he goes to Elvis's house, which is a small island. He ends up confronting him and Elvis tells him that it was requested by someone named General Montanes. He tries to kill Ramiro, but we end up going... Angel then calls us and tells us that both the military and the police are looking to get to Ramiro. Ramiro manages to get away, only to be involved in a roadblock near a bridge, held by a corrupted police chief. Of course, Ramiro is built different and takes care of them. We later find out that General Montanas is part of the Mexican military and also a part of the CIA, which concerns Tommy. So we pay the general a visit in the jungle, taken there by Rico, go on him and provide some information to Tommy through a satellite, and then fly back. The information Tommy got stated that the general is aware of a plan that Papa Muerte was plotting. Remember the empty coffin crates? Yeah, instead of having dead DEA agents in there, there would be cartel members with military grade weapons transported via a train to ambush the DEA and take the coke back that they were holding. Their plan was to later blow up the building which would erase any trace left behind and distribute the coke evenly and directly into the US. When we head back to Angel's apartment, we get surprised by an ambush of Papa Muerte's men inside, with Angel nowhere to be seen. Remember the special agents? These two. They came right before Ramiro was caught and remember how Angel was also undercover? Then who gave away Ramiro's information? Well, since Angel was undercover and Pierce had kind of... We can safely assume that it was Agent Johnson. Special Agent Johnson then doses Tommy and his colonel with a drug leaving to die off an overdose. Tommy was smart enough to open the mic for Ramiro to hear so he could know what was going on. So now we have to cross the Mexican border while being wanted by the police on the island. But we built... So we cross the border, enter the DEA's headquarters, and provide our brother and the colonel with an adrenaline shot to save their lives. We also try to stop the bomb from exploding, messed it up the first time because we didn't know where to go and what to do, but we end up taking care of it later by placing the bomb in a train. We end up on the train with Johnson and Angel on it. She probably ended up here because she ruined Johnson's plans to get rid of Ramiro and helped him get away. The DEA notifies the military that a train containing a hundred ton of coke is being transported. Taking no chances, they decided to blow up the bridge that the train would be passing through. Oh. But Johnson disconnects the rest of the train so he could get rid of Ramiro. But luckily due to his gamer rage and a little bit of luck, we find a bike to follow the train. Now tell me how on God's green earth is this bike so fast that it's catching up to a train. I'll tell you how. It's cause we built 
We then move on to the worst boss fight in the game, shooting a military grade anti-aircraft gun. This did way too much damage to me, even the creators of the game knew it would so they just left rewinds and health bonuses all over the map. Also, how does he have infinite bullets? After taking care of the anti-aircraft, we just speed up to the front of the train to save Angel. Huh? Now tell me why we couldn't just do that without dealing with the aircraft. If you don't make it, I want you to know, you are gorgeous. And if we do make it, forget I ever did that. Gracias, Ramito. That was breathtaking. Anyways, we take care of Angel, have a sweet heroic moment with her, and then just drive off. Johnson's hat just kind of flies by, implying he's dead. Or is he? Then the game just ends. Honestly, the plot of the game is a lot better than I expected it to be. It almost caught me off guard because of how much I underestimated it. The gameplay felt smooth, and the graphics are pretty great for a game made in 2005. I'm honestly surprised how so many people have played San Andreas, Prince of Persia, and Max Payne, but have never heard of this gem. The story is pretty creative, the graphics still somewhat hold up to this day, and I like its creativity and vibe. This game somewhat gave me the same feeling equivalent to being a kid and just staying home on a rainy day, putting up a casual simple game. That being said, the game also has some issues. The open world is kind of bland. There is not much to do other than running people over. Ah! Playing the Day of the Dead, which is a mini game where people dressed in a skeleton costume try to kill you. And having to wait for a long time between loading screens. Also, did I mention that there is no map to see where I'm going? There are also a lot of cars driving around, but there are almost no motorbikes to steal. I only got to ride motorbikes twice. One of them involves the ending. But hey, at least there are cars I can drive, right? Would have been great if the driving physics wasn't so shit. This game has a wide concept adapting from Prince of Persia, GTA, and Max Payne. But having so much quantity, they dropped in quality. The open world is, well, empty like I just mentioned. The rewind feels choppy because you cannot control the duration of it like you can in Prince of Persia. The bullet time, however, is better since you can pull off flashier moves. Also, I don't seem to understand some bits of the story. They mentioned that Ernesto Cruz died of an overdose, but he was clearly thrown off a plane. I can label this as a corruption play in post-mortem, but fearing that in the game would have been better. Johnson wanted to blow up the DEA's headquarters, but I don't really get this point. If Johnson's men are securing the explosion, then wouldn't they die too? Why would they just die for that? Also, I don't understand why Angel is tied in front of the train. Johnson boarded the train thinking he would be leaving. He didn't know that the train would be headed towards the ground, so this is just stupid. If he wanted to kill her, then just do it. Why keep her around? But hey, at least I got this guy. <laughs> Deadline games were actually in the process of producing Total Overdose 2, but because of this game, and Disney, which I have played unfortunately, was so sh** that they had to shut down. I'm surprised they didn't get sued for emotional distress. So we are never going to know what's ever gonna happen in Total Overdose 2, but I don't wanna be nitpicky about it since it still is a pretty great game considering it was made in 2005. That being said, I'd rate this game a 6.5 out of 10. I can find myself playing this game if I have no internet, other than that, I don't think I'll ever play it again. If you're into retro games, then I suggest you check out this video. And if you're more of a novel enjoyer, I highly recommend you watch this one. Subscribe.